to Precious Testimonies. I'm Kathleen Rasmussen, and I will be your hostess today for this broadcast. In the book of Psalms 96, verse 3, it reads to declare God's glory among the nations and His wonders among the people. And that's what Precious Testimonies is all about. We allow born-again Christians to come and share how God has become real and alive in their lives, how He took them from a life of destruction and no, no hope of getting out of whatever lifestyle they were in to a life of peace and joy and happiness, which can only be found in Jesus Christ. So today, we want to share with you a testimony from a woman who has, he has done just that for her. And her name is Susan Brown, and she's from the Grand Rapids, Michigan area. And she has got an awesome story to tell you. And I encourage you to listen. Don't, don't change channels or don't, don't turn the TV off because I, I'm sure that there's going to be something that you might be able to relate to. She's come out of a life of, of a lot of hurt and a lot of pain with drugs and alcohol and even her husband being in prison. So I just encourage you to listen. Don't let, don't hang up or turn the TV off, but sit back and listen and see what God maybe has for you, okay? Thank you now for listening, and Suzanne or Susan will be coming here shortly. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Brown, and I would like to take this time and opportunity to thank Sister Kathleen and Brother Norm for allowing me to share my testimony, unprecious testimony. I just want to thank God for them. I just want to tell you a little bit about where I've came from and how the Lord has really blessed my life and He has brought me from some of the darkest times of my life, really out of the muck and the mire. To be truly honest with you, I, I came from a mess. He brought me from a long way, you know, from out of drug houses and prostitution and just hanging out in places where I had no business. But even before I get there, just to tell you that my, my family and my lifestyle growing up, I wasn't always, you know, into streets and drugs. Growing up was really, really a blessing. And even when I came here at the age of 13 and moved here, you know, I thought this was one of the safest places I could have been. And even at the time, uh, a lot of it came through some of the things that I ventured out in when I got older. And even at that, at the age of 13, we moved here, and like I said, it was one of the best times. All I can remember then was just playing softball and basketball, high school days, and just really doing the sports thing. I was very tomboyish. But then, you know, after I got older, maybe around the 12th grade, I started to realize that those were really some of the lowest and some of the darkest days I could have imagined because I never shared any uh, of my emotions with my family or my sisters. I did sports and athletic things just to cover up who I really was and how I really felt on the inside. I did a lot of those things just so that I couldn't feel because uh, when I got older I started hearing stories of how we went through these struggles and how we had nothing to eat half the time. But half the time I really didn't know that because some of those things I blocked out. Literally, I don't remember not having anything to eat. I don't remember not having a Christmas gift. And every time I looked around, my dad had something for me. But I realized that some of those days that I really blocked out because I didn't want to face it. I didn't want to, you know, understand who and what my family really was. And a lot of times that my father had house parties or we had uh, gambling parties, I really, I really thought that was the thing that we, uh, the norm of things. And so it didn't really bother me. But then when I really realized that a lot of the things I just hid inside, and I said, look, God, I need some help. I don't know where to turn. And then maybe going on till about after high school, I'll say, I ventured out. I think soon after I graduated from high school, I started hanging out, going to places that I had no business going, or getting high with friends, or smoking marijuana, and just venturing because I lived such a sheltered life and wanted to be a, a party person, but really I wasn't. I didn't fit in anywhere, so I tried to make myself fit in. And so I thought that by hanging out 
and even going out to bars with my family would make me fit in, but I still felt something was missing on the inside. Something was always missing. I can remember sitting outside in a, in a family member's car and just saying, God, something, I need someone to really love me because we, we were a close family, but we weren't the affectionate kind of family that would always hug and tell everyone, oh, I love you. But on the inside, we knew. I was the kind of fighter also because I used to take up for all my brothers and you know there was a closeness there that we would just know without saying it. But yeah, sometimes I wanted to feel it, I, I needed the affection. And so a lot of times I never expressed that to anyone. And so that's what I consider the dark days in my life, days that I really blocked out a lot of my feelings and a lot of my emotions. Even going through high school, I blocked out things that, you know, I, I normally would say, oh, my sister would say, well, didn't you know we went through this? Or didn't you know? I was like, no, I didn't know that. What do you mean that happened? I, I didn't remember that ever happening. So, you know, just to say that, that sometimes that we can, even as young children, young adults, we can block out some of the things in our lives that we thought that wasn't so pleasant. So we tend not to forget uh, we tend not to remember those things, so those are the things I blocked out. I didn't want to remember anything bad. My father was my hero, so you couldn't tell me anything bad about my dad. My dad was my was my uh, support system, you know, because the people in the neighborhood knew who my father was, and his name was James, but James Bugs, but everybody called him Bugs, so they knew who the kids were. He was a gambler, he was a hustler, and he was a good one. But you know, uh, uh, that's where we got that name from, the Bugs kids anyway. But so you couldn't tell me anything bad, you know, so I didn't want to hear the bad side and I didn't want to see the bad side. All I wanted to see was the good side and I, and I love my father dearly. And even in his passing on January of 98, you know, it really took a, a lot out of me. You know, because I never really got to tell him how much I really did love him and how much I really did care for him. So, you know, that's a that's a part of my life that um, that I, I would cherish forever is my dad being my hero. But then back to you know even the dark days and. I think once I got out of high school, things started to really move kind of fast for me. I got into the party and I got into hanging out with uh, 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 kids and uh, adults that I had no reason to be with. And then even had a child out of wedlock. At the age of 21, I got pregnant with my first child. And just really thinking when I got pregnant, wow, I'm going to have somebody to love, okay? And even getting pregnant by the person that I did, I thought maybe that if I had a child, maybe that he would love me even more. But it turned out it didn't even work out that way. We were supposed to go off to school together, get married. Didn't work. He went off. I stayed back and had the baby. Even had a second one when he came home. And then he went back again. So I wound up never going to college, never really getting to do what really I wanted to do in my life because I was always trying to find love in all the wrong places. Tried to find it in me and tried to find it in kids and relationships and it didn't work. And so I had two kids by the age of 22 out of wedlock. And then just really, really, I think really that's where the depression really set in because I got so, so depressed because this man went off and left me with two children and nothing to do and nowhere to go. And so I just went aimlessly about life. Just I, I went to one place from another, not really staying with my mother, not really staying with his mother, but just in between places. And so that went on for a while until finally I met someone. I met a man and that really changed my life. And we still, we wasn't married, but I knew he loved me. And I think that was in 1980. I graduated from high school in 1977. 79, I had two children. 1980, I met a man that really, really turned my life around. And soon after that, I had another child. I had three kids out of wedlock. Three kids out of wedlock, but it was okay. At least I knew that I had someone to love me. And then I was finally kind of getting my life together, still struggling, and this man was, was the best thing that ever happened to me. And so after that, 
I think around 1983, things started to fall apart again. I believe in 1983 is where my life really fell apart. The man that I really loved and really wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And I also say by, by the time 1983, I had five kids. So since 79 to 83, five children, single mom. The man I really cared for went to prison for 14 and a half years. And so I'm left alone again, left alone to face Susan which I really hated facing. I really hated facing, I'll say that again. And so I'm left alone with five children. And I do have a loving family, but nobody really understands. Sisters and brothers all doing their own thing. And so depression, instant depression, instant depression all over again set in. And so what do I do? Instead of really buckling down, getting my life together, taking care of my children, I wanted an easy way out. And I just thought, well, I'll just go and do what I've been doing. When depression sets in, I'll go get high. I'll go get some uh, marijuana. But marijuana wasn't good enough, so I ventured out on cocaine. Eventually, I ended up on crack cocaine. Prostitution hanging out in places where I know I had no business to be in, but not wanting to be labeled as a prostitute. I'll do it at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning just to get drugs, just to get something that would ease my pain, just to get something that would take me away from all the responsibilities I had to face. I didn't want to face them. And so what I did, I kept going and I kept going. I would stay in places that I wouldn't take baths for three and four days, maybe weeks, maybe weeks, because I wanted to get high. I didn't want to face anything, and I didn't want to face anybody. And so I'd go, and I'd leave my kids. I'd leave my children in the home by themselves because I knew my family would come and rescue them. I knew that they would come. And, um, and take them and take care of them. So that's what I did. And so that went on for quite a while. It went on for quite a while before I came to my senses. I remember my husband, well, my husband now, I'll get to that part, is my fiance then. Um, I met a couple through Angel Tree. He had sent once he had got incarcerated, he sent a letter to them, you know, to have them bring gifts for his children. And I remember this couple coming to my home and presenting some gifts. And in presenting those gifts, they presented someone that I had, was not familiar with, and his name was Jesus. They presented him also, and they closed in an awesome prayer asking if we wanted to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and I said yes not knowing that that was even the beginning of, of what I call even worse days, but that's okay. Because I had made the open confession, but not really knowing what that meant. And so after this couple left my home, I still began to get high. I still began to do my own thing. I still began to just do, uh, uh, sit, and even when they came, even when they would come, and present more gifts, not even just angel tree, even they would come and just take my kids off on little outings. I still would have no part of it. And even when I did, I had my cocaine, I had my drugs with me, I had my support with me because I didn't think that that was enough support. And I didn't know how to kick the habit. And I didn't know how to really give up. But even if you're out there, listen, even if you're struggling, even if you want to do the things that you're doing. Know that Jesus Christ is a deliverer, and that's who helped me. He was my deliverer, and that's the bottom line that I want you to get. If you get anything else, know that there's a deliverer. Know that there's a savior. Know that there's somebody out there that can really hear. They say they don't hear. Someone told me that. They don't hear the prayers of a sinner. Well, I want you to know at the end of my addiction, I was sitting in my home. This person had, well, I'll back up the church that they came from, presented me with an opportunity. They furnished me with a home with everything in it, from beds, dressers, everything that you can imagine. I never had to want for food or clothing or anything. Even in my addiction, they did this for me. 
because I portrayed it as if there was nothing really wrong. And I want you to know at the end of that, after they gave me everything, I sat in a chair, empty house with only one chair left in my home after selling the dresser, the beds, <laughs> the food. Parents bought me a washing dryer, sold the washing dryer. Anything that wasn't nailed down, I sold it for drugs. I was on welfare assistance, food stamps, sold them. Any type of monies I would get, I would sell it for drugs. Brother even gave me a car, I tried to sell that, but it didn't work. So I want you to know, these are, those are some of the worst days in my life, but I wouldn't trade any day. My worst day today is better than any day I had in my addiction, any day. And so I want you to know that I'm not glorifying my addiction. I'm just telling you where the Lord has brought me from and how he has sustained me through it all. And so I was sitting in a chair, i never forget it, I was sitting in a chair, the only chair left in my home. And I heard the Lord, I know now it was the Spirit of the Lord, I heard him specifically say, I had the crack pipe in my hand. He said, if you would just put that down and walk away, I'll set you free for the rest of your life. And it's been 12, 11 or 12 years. I have not wanted cocaine, crack cocaine, have not desired it, haven't even had a desire to go back. Instantly I was set free. Instantly I was delivered in my home. Instantly nobody came and laid hands. Nobody prophesied to me. The Lord himself spoke to me in a living room in my chair. And I got up, put the crack pipe down, walked out of the front door and never looked back. Never ever looked back. So even if you've got a crack pipe in your hand, even if you're struggling with alcohol and drugs, know that God is a deliverer. Know that he is a healer. Know that he is a restorer and he forgives you and he remembers your sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, he has not brought back my, up my past since then. And so after he delivered me, I went to a treatment center in Detroit for 11 months. I should back up and say too that after I had left my children in my home countless times, my family, in family independence, my family, my real family called child support or whatever. I thought it was a bad thing at the time for my family to call the people and just take my children. But you know one thing, that was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because my family had my children. It brought me back to reality. If anyone take my kids, that was my really my whole purpose for living. I just didn't want to face it and I knew then that I loved my children. And that's what really snapped me back. I said, God, I want my family. I want my children back. And do you not know, after spending 11 months in that treatment center, the Lord restored my children. After just 11 months, I have all five of my children. They're all grown now. They all have children. I'm a grandmom now. But just to let you know, God is a healer. He's a deliverer. Those dark days in my life, are slowly fading away. And even after the time that my husband went to prison for 14 and a half years, I want you to know half of those two years I didn't wait. I didn't want to wait. I said, God, I don't want to wait 14 and a half years for anybody. But God, I think the first four or five years of that relationship, I was not faithful. I was out doing my own thing. But after the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, after I got saved, after I got healed and delivered, God kept me for the remaining of those years that he spent. He kept me celibate. I didn't want sex on outside of marriage. I didn't want promiscuity. I did not want fornication in my life. God delivered not only the drugs, smoked like a chimney, <laughs> smoked and, and cursed like a sailor. You know, I, I sit before you now looking like, oh, she's never done anything, but oh no, this is only the Holy Spirit. This is only the Spirit of the Lord that has cleaned me up. There's nothing I did on my own, nothing that I created on my own. And I give him all of the glory and all of the honor. And so I just sit before you today telling you after 14 and a half years of waiting, I waited for my husband. I waited for Perfecto Brown. I waited for him with the Lord on my side. And we're married today, have been married for five years now. Family has been restored. 
family and children have been restored after venturing out, after struggling, after going and doing my own thing. The Lord, the Lord, nobody but God could have put it back together. And so I just want to really encourage those that really don't know God, encourage you to get to know Him, encourage you to open up your hearts, encourage you to know that God is a God of a breakthrough. He's a right now God. He is. I've been saved for almost 11 years now, and even today I struggle. Not saying that once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that you won't have any more struggles. I'm not going to sit there and tell you that because just recently I had some struggles. But do you not know that God is still a deliverer? I have to walk in deliverance, daily deliverance. I'm now in a ministry that loves me. Once you get saved, you have to get into a ministry that loves you. When I got saved, I got connected to people that loved me. I have an apostle and a prophetess that allows me to flow and allows me, has opened up to who I am. They know who I am. They impart into me things and say, Susan, do you know that this is who you are now in Christ Jesus? And that's what I believe now. I know who I am. I'm no longer that frightened little girl, scared of admitting that I don't want failure, scared to admit that I don't want to hear the bad things. When bad things come to me now, I know how to handle them with the Word of God. I know how to open the scripture and go to uh, Romans and know that I'm always struggling in my flesh. Paul said that uh, I war in, there's a war going on in my member. The things that I want to do, I don't do. But the things that I, the things that I would do, those are the things that I do, that I don't do. And so you're going to struggle. We're going to struggle in our lives. I have struggles even today. But God is still a deliverer, and he's still a healer. And I just want to take a time to just really look up uh, two scriptures that the Lord is imparting in my spirit. And I just want to share those scriptures with you just in closing to give you encouragement, to give you hope, and know that you have an expected end and a future that God wants good and not evil. And he's working things out on your behalf. Know that you can wait. If you have a loved one that's incarcerated, know that God can impart and strengthen you to wait. If God is telling you to wait, wait. If God is telling you to be celibate, be celibate. If God is saying stop doing what you're doing, then stop doing it. Because he knows what's good for us. He knows, he knows the things that we, that we desire. And so I just want to read these scriptures. And this is what the Lord has called me to do. He's made me a voice in the wilderness. He told me to speak loud. He told me to pray for those that are lost, those that are bound with alcohol and drugs and addictions. And he said that he would set the captives free. And God has given me the ministry of reconciliation to speak into men and women's lives and to snatch them out of the grips of the enemy. And that's what he has set me free. Everything that I went through in my life was for somebody else. And that's all I want to share with you. And so I'm going to get those scriptures and, and I'll um, share them with you. Amen. I just want to share a few scriptures with you the Lord had imparted in my spirit. Psalms 34, and this is the Psalms that talks about David. David knew God as his deliverer. David knew God as his healer. Not only did David was a mighty man of valor and a mighty warrior, but David also had faults. David also committed some of the most sins that anyone can imagine, but yet he was a man after God's own heart. And that's what God truly wants us to be, a person after his own heart. If we just keep a repentant heart and a repentant spirit, and he just led me to these scriptures. In Psalms 34 and 4 says, I sought the Lord 
and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles the angels of the Lord encamped around all those who fear him and he delivers him God is a deliverer he's a healer he's my deliverer that's what I choose him today to call him today I sat in a room with nothing else and he didn't look at me as if I was the worst person in the world all he told me was Susan put the crack pipe down and I'll set you free forever and I heard a voice and he delivered me and so I love him today and I want to admonish you whatever you're going through in your life John 3:16 said that God so loved the world that he gave he gave he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should, would have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting. That doesn't mean that sometimes, all the times, everlasting. That's what everlasting means, forever and ever. And some of you may have a hard time of grasping that, but just take the few of it. Just take the juice of it. He gave. He gave Jesus Christ for you today. And so in closing, just want to share with you, know that God loves you. Know that God hears you. Know that God is a deliverer. Know that God will set you free from any addiction, set you free from any, anything, any abusive relationship. If you're struggling with anything that's unclean, anything in your life that is a struggle, anything that you're bound with habits and addiction. Know that God is a deliverer. Know that he's closer than you think. God was so close to me that I didn't even know it. He was there all the time. Even through situations that I, I can even remember, and I just want to share this part. I can remember getting into a situation in Chicago. I had left Grand Rapids running for drugs running and I went to Chicago and ran into the same situation I had gotten myself in a bind went to a hotel didn't know the people I was with left me in the room didn't know how I was going to get out of the room so it happened the people left I walked out didn't know where I was going didn't know Chicago I left at a young age wandering around the streets of Chicago and the Lord sent a person that led me all the way back to a place where I was familiar with, a familiar surroundings where uh, my relatives were. This was an angel of the Lord. The Bible said the angel of the Lord encamped around all those who fear him. Even in my unclean and unregenerate state, I had a fear, a fear and didn't know what it was. And God sent an angel and he led me to safety. So even if you're in a situation before I close, I'm gonna pray with you that God would send an angel that will release and that would protect you and your loved ones and your family. And that God would somehow get a listening ear that you would tune in and hear what God is saying to you. And now, Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that those that are listening, God, whatever you have had me to say, Father, that you would touch the very life, that you would loose them, that you would remove all shackles of drugs, all shackles of infirmities, all shackles. I call even the prostitute, I call even the drug addict, I call even those that have no hope, those that have hopelessness and despair. God, you are father to the fatherless, you are mother to the motherless, God. And we're praying in Jesus' name, God, that you would draw them by your spirit. But you said that no man could come to you except you draw them. God, so we're lifting up the name of Jesus. You said, if I be lifted up, that you would draw all men to you, Father. So you draw them by your spirit. I speak to the person, Father, that has no hope that's sitting right now in front of the television. God, with no hope at all, lost and confused. And we break the bonds of the enemy of confusion and doubt and fear. And God, we're asking that you draw them back to you. God, that you would make them know who you are, Father. Those that are sitting right now, swaying between back and forth. God, should I accept you? God, should I let go? Father, how do I let go? Just let go. 
It's not a hard thing. The Bible said if we confess Jesus Christ in the book of Romans, if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, know that if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ rose from the dead, that Christ rose from the dead, that you're saved. If you confess him, just confess the Lord Jesus Christ and know that God is a healer. Know that he can set you free. And God, we just speak healing and deliverance to your people. We just speak healing. God, heal them. Heal every hurt. Heal every wounded spirit. Heal every person, even the backslider. God, you said you're married to the backslider. Draw the backslider back. Draw those, God, even family members that are sitting, even those born-again Christians that are sitting, praying for those that are strung out on drugs, those that are incarcerated. You think that there's no hope. I'm here today to let you know that there is hope. There is hope. There is hope. And I believe, I believe God for you. And I stand in agreement and I touch and agree that God will deliver your loved one, that God will set the loved ones that you're praying for free, that you would set them free, God. Set those that are out there, strung out on crack cocaine, God strung out on alcohol. Father, we're praying that you go into the crack houses in the recesses of their mind, God, and you set them free and you heal them. Even where they're sitting, even in their lowest state, God, you send an angel, Father, to draw them back to you. And Father, I just thank you for what you're doing and for where you've brought me, Father. And I give you all the honor and all the praise. And I just pray that this has blessed you. I pray that you have been a blessed by just hearing the word of the Lord. Not what I've done, but what God has done in my life. And know this, know this, that he loves you unconditionally. He does not hold your sins against you. He does not hold anything against you. He remembers your sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, I know that if you accepted him, then you're saved. You believe in him, then you're saved. Now walking in your deliverance. Get connected to a body. Get connected to a family. Get connected. Get connected. Do not forsake yourselves. Even those that said, I will never go to church again in my life. Been there. The worst hurt has come. Even in the ministry. Been wounded and hurt. Even in the ministry. And haven't given up. Because he didn't give up on me. Men have failures. Even in the body of Christ, there's failures. But look to God. Look to Jesus as your Savior. Look to him. Been wounded even in the ministry. So God, even those that have swayed away from the ministry, saying, I will never, ever go to church again. Go. Find someone. Find a place. There's pastors with pastors' hearts, with shepherds' hearts. So they're waiting for you. Get connected to a body. And so that they can feed you, so that they can pour in, so that you can get healed, so that you can go and share, so that deliverance can take place, and so that you can know how to heal your emotions. Get connected to someone that God is really leading you to, though it has swayed away from the path of righteousness. God is calling you back to him. And I just close with that. Know that God is calling you back. He's married to the backslider. And I really hear that. I really hear him calling the backsliders. I really hear him calling you back to him. He wants to get reconnected. He wants to reestablish himself in you. Those that are backslidden say, God really, really wants to show you more than what you've seen. You've not seen enough of him. You've seen too much of, of, of man. God said, I really want to show you who I am. And he said, come back, come back. And I thank God for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Rasmussen again. For those of you who may be flipping channels and wonder what you're watching, you're watching a broadcast called Precious Testimonies. And we have just been listening to a woman share about her life and share her testimony. And her name is Susan Brown. And we want to take a moment here now and just thank her. Thanks, Susan, 
for coming and sharing like she has, how she's opened up and how she's being, been willing to allow the Holy Spirit to use her and to minister to, to you, to anyone who may be hurting or just anyone who needs, needs some encouragement and needs to be blessed to keep going because maybe they're in a spot where they're, they're serving the Lord too and they were just wondering, am I doing all that God wants me to do? Well, I'm just, I encourage you to take, take heart and be encouraged because I know she shared a lot that was so, so good and so precious for so many. So many that are hurting, so many that are searching, and so many that love the Lord and want to do exactly what He wants them to do too. I, as I was listening to her share, I, I heard her say something that just sparked something inside of me that God is like that too. She shared that she didn't want to look at anything but the good side of her father, meaning her, her earthly father. She didn't want to look at the negative or the bad. She wanted to look at the good. That's all she wanted to see about her dad. And I, I heard that and I thought, that is exactly how God is. He does not want to look at the bad in us. He only sees the good, from, not from, from what we are doing or have been or maybe even going to do yet in, in the future. He sees what we're going to be before we even get there. And that is so awesome, so awesome to me because I know, I know He even does that with me. I'm not where you know, I see I want where I want to be. I've been, I've been saved, born again now for 23 years, and I know there is so much more for me to do and, and to, to be for Him. But He's so patient. He is so patient, and He is just waiting, waiting on me until I am right and ready, just at the right place where I can do what He wants me to be doing. And I don't always know what that is. I have these ideas of things that I, I really would like to do and how I would like to be used of Him in ministry. But I know I'm not there yet, but He's, he's, he's so patient and so kind and just waiting, just waiting for me to get to the place where maybe I can do those things. And, I, and He's already doing that. You know what? He is doing it. In, in some ways, and I want to share one way with you, and that is with, I'm being used in prison ministry, where I never thought I would ever, ever have an opportunity to do that. I never thought I could do that. But <laughs> I was set up, really, to tell you the truth, I was set up. We were, we were asked by another prison ministry to come and uh, minister to some prisoners in, an, in, a, in a prison nearby where we live. We live in Grand, in Grand Rapids area and this prison is in Carson City and there's another ministry that goes in to that prison on a consistent basis and we, because of this ministry that we do with, with testimonies on our website and on video, somehow prisoners got a hold of our ministry. I think it was through a book somehow that they began to write us. So we, we began to have dialogue with different prisoners. And there was a, a certain prisoner in this, in this prison who began to um, talk to that ministry that was coming in there about contacting us and seeing if we would be willing to come in and minister there. And one thing led to another and it, it just happened, happened that way that we started ministering there. And 
the first time we went in there, I wasn't planning on being, you know, one of the people up front there speaking or singing or anything. I was just there with my husband. That was my thoughts. I was there with him and that ministry. So I went along and they had, a, you know, a first a time of a worship before the service started or before the, the speaker came on, which the speaker was going to be my husband and you know, I was just there in support of him. And so we started singing a few songs and I'm not a great singer. I don't claim to be and I know I'm not, not compared to some, so many others. <laughs> But I know I love the Lord and I love to worship. So when I sing in worship, it's not just songs, it's not just words, but I'm, I try to sing from my heart. And they heard me singing and they wanted me to go up there and lead in this worship time with, the, with this man who was doing this too. And so I willingly agreed to do that and I went up and, you know, did it. You know, they were singing out of hymn books and I wasn't planning on doing it again. We finished that night and we all said our goodbyes and we were planning to come back again in about six more weeks, which that's the time frame of, you know, when we would go in. And I didn't plan to do it again. I didn't have thoughts of doing it again. But those prisoners wanted me to do that again and they planned on me doing that again and they put me on the spot when we came in again they they just assumed that I was going to do it so I I couldn't I couldn't say no I don't want I don't want to say no if maybe God is trying to get me to do something that maybe <laughs> I'm not comfortable with yet but I just want—I I just want to say I want to be ready, in season and out of season. I've learned that through my life, through my Christian life, to be ready in season and out of season. And so that's why I didn't um, hesitate or say, "Well, no, I, mean, I don't know if I'm ready for this." <laughs> I did it. I did it again, and I just let the Holy Spirit move through me. So then, it was after that after that night, that second time, where I really, really knew and believed in my heart that God wanted me to be doing this. So the third time when we went back, I was prepared. And I've been prepared ever since. And we keep going in there. And the more we go in, the more, more at ease I become in doing this. It's, it's not something I'm used to doing, but it's, I know it's been a desire of my heart because I remember back in the early years of my new Christian walk how I would I would see people up there ministering you know in in services or church services or meetings or something and I would see them singing and I would think oh, I wish I could do that I wish I could do that but I never really made it a a point to pray and seek God for it. But you see, way down the road, he's just waiting, just waiting for the right time and the right place to help me be in that place where I could be used. And I, like I said, I, I don't believe I'm a good singer, but I love the Lord and I love to worship. And I know that's what they can feel when I'm doing this and I, I'm hoping and praying that I am bringing them into an atmosphere of worship for him too because that's why I'm doing it. It's the only reason I'm doing it. So I share all that to share. Now Susan's husband is going to be coming and sharing Praise God, he's going to share what God is going to do, has been doing for him, and how he's moved in his life. And I encourage you to listen because I know there's so much more. You are going to be so blessed if you listen more now to hear what God has done for him. 
because she shared about how long she waited for him. She waited for God and she waited for him to come to get out of prison. And now he's going to share his side. And I just thank the Lord for that. Hang on, okay? Hi, my name is Perfecto Brown. I'm the other half of Susan Brown. And yes, I was, as you can see, this was totally unexpected. I was just here as an observer. And somehow, as always, God has a different plan than we do. And that's where I want to start with my testimony. As you heard my wife say that I was in prison for 14 and a half years, which really wasn't my first time. This was my second time. The first time I was in prison for approximately six years. You know, so the first time in another state I went to prison, you know, I, I was never a patient man, though, so I thought I couldn't be patient. So I wanted money right away. So I took the law in my own hands and I considered myself a professional thief or a robber, you know, and I took pride in that. I guess that's what I really thought I could do best. So I robbed people and then I began to rob establishments. And the more I got away with it, the more I had a thrill in doing it. So the first time I went to prison for robbery, it wasn't good enough for me to understand that that wasn't the way to go. So I wind up doing it again. This time is what my wife was talking about, the 14 years and some odd months. And even then, while in prison, as I said before, my most important point is we may have a plan, but God has a better plan. He always has a better plan, but he never forces us to do what he wants us to do. And that's what I really learned this time, the 14 years and some odd months that I did. Because I said, when I went to prison this time, there was nothing going to keep me there. So briefly, I say, I always had a plan of escape. I wanted to get out of prison. I wasn't going to allow them to keep me for 14 years and some odd months. So I always made a plan, always met someone who was willing to have an escape plan. And this would begin to make me realize that God had a different plan for me. Because every time that I made a plan, and it always seemed like a very good plan to escape, God wouldn't say he, wouldn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't gonna allow me to escape, but he would always take the things away from me that put me on that course. And I begin to wonder, why was this always happening? And one day, I asked God, I said, now you want me to do all this time? Because it seems like you keep stopping me from getting away. What, what are you going to do for me? And my, my fiance, Susan Brown, well, she's my wife now. And well, of course, we met. She said 1980, but we met in 1978. The very first day I met her, I knew somehow she was going to be my wife. She was the woman that I was always looking for. I want to make that very clear because, see, for a man to really establish himself, he must have a wife that he can truly trust. And she was the first woman that I ever trusted in my life. And so even that, I still, I still wind up in prison, you know, after we came united, 1980. I still wind up in prison. It hurt me, and I thought my life was over. And I, I did what most people do when they go to prison. I, I wrote her a letter and told her to go on with her life, forget about me because I messed up. And I say about a week later, I wrote her a letter again and told her, nope, I changed my mind. I can't do it. I got, you know, I'll be back. So in prison, 
me and my wife, we struggled. Well, she wasn't my wife then, but we struggled. I considered her my wife. I guess I'm proud to say that now. You know, she was always my wife, but, you know, we made it legal after I got out of prison. But I always struggled with it. You know, I, my main thing, until I decided that God wanted me to do this time, 14 years, eight months, I couldn't see it. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. You know, but he, I had to do it. So I said, okay, if I do it, you got to show me that I'm going to have something worthy of me spending all this time in prison to change my life. And it, I say about, about the same time that I did this, Susan wrote me. And matter of fact, ain't this something? She sent me a red sweatsuit in prison. Now I got red where I don't know now. But she sent me a red sweatsuit that evening. I got it in the mail. And she was telling me that she wanted us to be together and and you know and you know and and move on with our lives. It was like an answer to that prayer that I had just spoke with God. I had asked him what was gonna happen, and he showed me that Susan was gonna be there for me when I got out. I still didn't believe it. I had to see more. And so as time went on, you know. As you heard my wife's testimony, she struggled with things, you know, that you know that we all go through, ups and downs. But one day I knew for sure she was a true Christian. And she convinced me of that, you know, and she kept trying to convince me that God was the way. And I kept listening to her and I didn't I never really wanted to deny her. But I wasn't one too very easy to convince. You know, I believed, you know, we could make a life, but you know, I didn't I didn't know if God was really for me. But at the end of my time in prison, there was my wife waiting there. She came, picked me up, you know, sometimes guys, you know, in prison, you know, waiting for something to pick you up and they never show up. I was prepared to catch the bus. But she was there, and she brought me home. And I say within two weeks, we was married. And I, you know, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm still a hard man to convince. You know, even though I committed all these crimes and 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 did all these wrong things in my life, I know the most important thing in my life was having a woman to love me and I could trust. And that's what brought me to God, Jesus Christ. But even when, even coming to Jesus Christ with, with this most important woman, which I knew, I used to watch her, you know, I'd go to church with her, you know, I was kind of laid back. And even, even my pastor always told me, you know, that I didn't really accept God completely. And I and I felt that was true because, you know, I'm always I have to see more than what what people say. I believe in doing and I believe people got to do more for me to be convinced. But I'm convinced now that Jesus is the way. You know. I did I mean I did some looking at me right now, you couldn't even believe or, you know that I was really you know, I robbed banks, you know, and I, and I, you know, I had great fun in it. I didn't really like causing people harm. I guess that's probably why I really started robbing banks. I felt I could just take the money out the banks and not harm people. But sometimes people can't get hurt in them things. But that's, that's my past. And I know some people thrive on, you know, the wrong things in life. But I know robbing banks, you know, or, or, you know, taking other people's money, anything, I know that's not right. And we all know that's not right. I did some terrible things in my life, and I don't really like to really talk about them, but I know if, if God can bring me out of one of the worst prisons, you know, where 
when I was in prison, it was totally, it was just like, I couldn't believe that guys would kill each other for nothing. Just for walking, stepping on your feet or, or because you didn't give them a, the right size piece of cake, you know. And God protected me from these things because I was in them situations where it, would, it could either be kill or be killed. But I know it wasn't because I was the baddest person in prison. It was that. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't saved in prison. You know, I, I just, you know, but I didn't take no stuff. But I know if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be here talking today. But I've seen people lose their lives for nothing. And I thank God for that because I know it was him. And I don't, want, I don't want guys in prison to think just because you want to be a Christian, you're soft or you, you're not a man. I discovered it takes a greater man to be a Christian than me not a Christian. I discovered that and that, and that, and that, and that, that makes me real proud because now I can say, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, and I don't, I don't feel shame and I don't feel slighted. And I'm telling you, what, I, what I've discovered most of all is, it's kind of difficult for me to talk on television, you know, because it's, you know, it's, I don't know what we do when we get on TV, we just forget so much. But I could never forget that if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people say, now how can a man say Jesus Christ? But I tell you, what made me discover Jesus was the one that guided us through all these troubles. I've thought about all these different people who claim to have our best interests at hand. I only know one perfect one. And we can go all over the world and look for it. And if you're gonna follow someone, you should want them to be perfect. You know, if you're gonna follow that person, they should be perfect. And the only person that I know that was ever introduced to me that was perfect was Jesus Christ. And that was my, my point of knowing that I would never turn away from Jesus. I know that now. And say, no matter what I do, I can't be convinced of nothing else because Jesus was the only perfect one that I know. And that's what, that's what made my heart soft. Or as you say, might say, made me be able to reveal who I really am. You know, I always had a deep compassion for people. And now I don't, I'm not ashamed to share that, you know, I'm not even ashamed to cry anymore, you know. You know, when I cry, you know, I know why I cry, you know. Sometimes I used to cry, it may be because of pain, but now when I cry, it's joy because I know what it represents. I'm so honored to be a part of Christianity. You know, it's, it's truly an honor to know that I'm following the perfect one. So I can't really lose. And I really have to give a lot of credit to my wife because she went through so much. And she was the woman, she convinced me because I, I could see that she was real. She wasn't, she wasn't pretending. And I knew the things that she went through, it would be all right. And I was touched by when she was mentioning about Angel Tree because even in, even in prison, a lot of people try to convince you that Christmas doesn't exist. <coughs> Excuse me. But I always thought about my children when I was in prison. I said, how do I tell my children that there's no Christmas? I said, well, if they want to believe there's no Christmas, it won't be won't be for me. And I knew that was an act of God too because when I decided to send my children Christmas gifts, that's how my wife 
discovered Jesus. So we was in this together way before we even thought about it. So when she discovered Jesus, even though I was just doing it because I wanted to give my children something that I couldn't reach out and touch them to let them know that they, daddy loved them. And I always was convinced of that. If nothing else, I was convinced. I said, if my children receive these gifts, they know their father loves them. If nothing else, I didn't go to prison because I didn't want to be around my children or I didn't want a better life. I did that what I thought could make me a better life, but I paid for it. And the reason I did them 14 years and eight months this time was because of my family. I decided that if I was going to change my life, I had to let this old way go. But when you do wrong things, just like with David, you know, when you do wrong things, there's a penalty you have to pay. So I had to pay with these 14 years and eight months to get the monkey off my back. And when I got, when I finished and I came home, in spite of all the things that my wife went through and my children even being taken away from her home. When I ended, when I, when I came home and, and my wife brought me home to my children, it was like I had never left. And that, and that gave me such a great joy to think that my children, even though they hadn't even seen me in all these years, and some of them was the first time they was even seeing me, they knew that I was their father. And that's another thing that you have to give credit to God and my wife, of course, because in spite of all the things that she'd done, she let, she let our children know that their father was still around and still available and was coming home. And that was my thing. I came home to my children. I came home and I, and I, and I made our, our marriage legal in God's name, in spite of all the turmoil that was through, you know. But I support my wife 100%, you know. I'm not, I'm not as aggressive in the ministry as she is, but there's no way that I can, just as you see me sitting here now, I came as an observer. And so when I wind up giving, sharing a portion of my testimony, you know, I didn't really go into a whole lot of detail, you know, I just, you know, highlighted that, you know, I was a criminal, you know, and, and I did a lot of time in prison. But I tell you, prison does not have to destroy you. It can be a force that you can be, you know, you can become a better person. I know that. I've been there. I still have morals. I still have, you know, I, I still have compassion for people. Even in prison where it was kill or be killed, you know, I could see. I even still, even when I, when, when I, when I saw guys kill other guys, you know, I didn't, I didn't just turn my head. I was, my question was always, what was the purpose? You know, you know, I mean, even if a person owe you money, why kill them? If, if they don't pay you, don't give them any more money. Life is life is much is too valuable. You know, you know everybody's not gonna. You know, you just, you know, it's it's a terrible life. Prison is not the way to go. And I know a, a lot of brothers and sisters in prison. You know, they live it as if it's all they have left. But I can tell you. If you truly believe, you know, and if you really want to know how to get out, then you got to find God. And there's only one perfect one. And you can search all you want. Seek and you shall find. If you really want to know, you'll find Jesus. I know. I found him. And I've always said, you know, I, would, I didn't believe I had to go to church. But I found a church home, too. And I believe we all need one of them too. But you gotta find the right one. I found the right one where I'm at now. I've been with this church ever since it came to Grand Rapids. And I'm gonna be here till God say it's time to go somewhere else. God is the most important factor. 
But it ain't nothing like having a wife and children that love you. Because that, that makes you love God even more. And I really, I really just don't know what to say. All I can tell you is, all you brothers and sisters in prison, you know, I've always wanted to go back into prison, but you know, they always say now, they try to keep ex-convicts out of prison, you know, because I've seen a lot of them come back, you know, and, and, and they fall to the wayside. But I tell you, if you, if you hear my voice and you see this video, it can happen to you. Just like it happened to me. I had a wife when I left 14 years ago, a girl, you know, but I knew, I knew in 1978 that this woman would be my wife. And I've seen some of the brothers come out of prison and I used to tell them that I was going back to the same woman that I left. They couldn't understand it. I guess I don't know why. Well, any of you that hear me now, or know me from Carson City, because I was there too. I told you I would go back to the same woman, and I'm back with her. She's my wife. All my children are gone, graduated from high school, some of them in college now. And I'm with Jesus Christ. And one day I hope and pray that I'll be able to come where you at, or you'll be able to come where I'm at. And I can tell you, Jesus Christ is the one. I know it now. I've been there and I'm living. I'm living proof that it can happen with Jesus. I'm living proof that, you know, no matter what anybody tell you, if you really want to know the truth, you'll get it. And that's what I always did. You know, I went, you know, I, you know, I, I like to read, I like to study history. And I believe there's a lot in history, but it ain't nothing like Jesus Christ, the only perfect one. That's, what, that's, that's really my focal point. You know, people can say they love you, and you know, they have failures, failures, but, and you know, and they tell you all these different wonderful things. But Jesus Christ, man, I, 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 I ain't never seen a flaw. I've never seen a flaw, you know, and, and that's what convinced me. And if you, can, if you can show me a flaw in Jesus Christ, then I can pat you on the back and say, okay, well, you, you, you go your way. But if you, can, if you can come to me and say, well, Jesus, Jesus Christ doesn't have a flaw, then you should be able to say at the same time, then I'm willing to follow Jesus. I'm willing to listen to what he has to say as to what I need to do. Because everything he tell you to do, can't go wrong. I found that out too. And I'm very pleased and, and I want all you brothers and sisters who, you know, go for bad, gang members, whatever, you know, you, you, know, you think uh, kill or be killed, you know, you, that ain't it. You know, that ain't it because, you know, sooner or later you're going to find out that's not in anyway. But it's, it takes a great man to be able to say, he loved Jesus. And you can love Jesus, you can love everybody else. And you don't have to be afraid of it. Because Jesus got my back, so I don't worry no way. You know what anybody say. And that's why I don't have no fears anymore. I used to be, a, I used to have a fear of failing more so than anything else. I really never had any fear, any other fear, but I never liked to fail. But now I don't mind stumbling and falling because I know Jesus got my back. And I'm going to I'm going to make it. I made it and I'm I'm not I haven't looked back. I'm not ashamed of of the time that I spent in prison because I knew it was for a purpose. And I know a lot of you guys that I that's still there cuz a lot of you guys I met doing life, sad to say. But it's possible that you can still get out. But you got to find out the right way. And that'll be your that'll be your proof right there that Jesus is a miracle worker. Because I'm an example of his work. Because ain't no way in the world you could convince me that I would be sitting here right now talking about I'm I'm a Christian and I love Jesus Christ. 
because I thought I was bad too, you know. I'm not soft just because I'm talking, you know, about this here, you know, as you know, that's, that's how I talk, you know, man to man, you know, I'm, I feel I'm a greater man now, you know, you know, so I love Jesus and uh, you can too, just don't be afraid, be courageous and do what you got to do. And I bet you whenever you meet me, you will never be able to say, Jesus betrayed you, although man will. I know I was betrayed by the people I love the most, but I'm still standing. And Jesus is right there with me, always had been. And another thing I remember, someone gave me a, a card about the footsteps in the sand. And I knew it was true when I read it. I just knew it. I, mean, I couldn't even, it wasn't nothing I could say about it. You said, what? You said you thought you was by yourself. Mm -hmm. And you saw that one set of footprints in the sand is when I was, I was carrying you. And I know he carried me. He carried me a long way. Because I've been, the prison that I've been in, I've been in one of the worst. My first bit, I feel, was the worst prison that I've ever been in because it was one of the toughest. And this prison, the last one, 14 years and eight months, it wasn't so bad it was that this is the worst prison. It was just that people didn't care about living. They didn't care about life. They just killed just, you know, just like it was, like I see young fellas on the streets now, they just shoot each other for nothing. And it's a sad thing because I know it's about love. They don't know what love is. And I want you, I want you to know, you don't have to be afraid to say, that you love another person, you know? And I love you. And you say, I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love that he has presented in me. I love you because I'm me. And Jesus taught me that love. And I'm not ashamed to share it with you, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm on it. And, I, and I, I, I got to give honor to, to my pastors, you know, because they are two of the people that I met other than my wife that I believe are real. And it's not too many people that you can say is real, but you can't be afraid to go forward because you're betrayed by so many people. You know, I've been betrayed by the people I love the most my family, I thought that they would never betray me. Family members that would never betray me. I thought it would never happen. I'd stake my life on it. And that's what almost cost me my life. But I love them today too. I've forgiven them. And I proudly can say I, I have forgiven them, you know? And I love them just like they never did anything wrong. Just like Jesus loved me. If he can love me, I know I can forgive anybody because I know I've, I did a lot of wrong things. Looking at me today, you wouldn't believe it. That's because I have a peace within myself. I know Jesus is real. And if you really wait on him, he'll give you what you desire. I have my wife as a prime example of that. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, I don't think we would be together even though I desired it to happen. It had to happen because he wanted it to happen. She found Jesus and I came back to Jesus. I hope this is something you can feed off of. Peace. Well, I appreciate so much Perfecto Brown sharing from his heart what you've just been listening to. If you happen to be flipping channels, tuned in a little late, you're watching the Precious Testimonies broadcast and um, it is an outreach ministry just giving common ordinary everyday people that you might see in the grocery store or street corner walking, have a Sunday afternoon stroll, sharing how God has worked 
in their lives, giving Jesus Christ the glory for doing it. I'd like to share a little bit about Jesus Christ. In America, it is easy to assume that everybody has heard about Jesus Christ, but I have found that that's not always so. A lot of people have heard lies and half-truths about this one we call Jesus. And I would like to share a few things with you about Jesus to at least give you an opportunity to hear some right things. And then if you choose to reject him, so be it. Before I do that, though, let me just share. I'm Norm Rasmussen, and uh, Kathleen shared earlier. That's my precious wife sharing some of the things that uh, she wanted to glorify God for. And uh, um, I just feel impressed to say that some of you in the Grand Rapids area who may not have a church family, a church home, um, I would like to encourage you to give some thought about attending or visiting the church where uh, Perfecto and Susan attend. Um, they, they attend New Covenant Life Fellowship at the corner of Madison and Alger. That's in South Westerly, maybe, I'm not sure, just south anyway, uh, Grand Rapids, at the corner of Alger and Madison. It's called New Covenant Life Fellowship. In fact, we're filming here um, as I speak, and we thank God for letting them, uh, letting, having them allow us to use their facility. And, uh, you know, some of you young children, I just really feel that what Perfecto was saying, that you don't have a strong father figure. In fact, your father may be in prison or you don't know where your father is. You may not even know who your father uh, might be. I, I, I just want to encourage you to consider coming to, 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 to New Covenant Life Fellowship. Come a Sunday and, and talk to Perfecto. Get to know him. Talk to him and let him tell you some things that maybe he wouldn't share on camera because you have your whole life ahead of you, young children. And, uh, you know, your parents would want you to do well in life. And there is so much pressure put on you to be like the other bad guys or the other bad gals. And you take pride in being bad and taking pride in being rebels. Well, Perfecto will be the first to tell you that that does not give you the grace and the blessing of God upon your life. It will only ultimately bring destruction. Don't let your friends tell you it's good to break the law. The law is there to protect all people. And though there are people, police officers, that are not perfect, Okay, it doesn't mean the law is not given by God to protect society against wrongdoing. And you heard Brother Perfecto, if you heard the first part, he took pride in being able to earn a living through robbery. Uh, we all want to take pride in something that we do. God has put it within each and every one of us to do something well so that others would look at us and say, you know, you really do that well. Well, what God has created all of us to do is to be useful to him, but to channel our desire to do something well so that it's helping humanity. And now Brother Perfecto has been raised up and he's here in this local church and now he's looking for ways to encourage people, to help people, to bring the best out in people. That's what God delights for his followers to do. And so I just want to encourage you, young people especially, maybe there's some of those of you who are older and you're, you're looking for a family who will love you and accept you and teach you about God and be real. Not just playing spiritual games, but be real. And I just pray that if you have not found that place yet in Christianity, consider the fellowship at the corner of Madison and Alger here in Grand Rapids. Now I just want to share something to you. Maybe you've not heard this before about Jesus Christ. 
See, Jesus Christ, some people want to reduce him down to a mere man who did wonderful things for God. Other people want to say, well, he was a prophet who was supernaturally endowed with power. Yeah, he did miracles, he did mighty, wonderful things, but that doesn't mean that he's the one that I want to put my trust in to get to heaven to be right with God. I reject that and I reject another way to God. I reject another religion. Well I want to share with you what uh, God has recorded about this one called Jesus if you've never heard it. And if you have a desire to really be pleasing to the one who created you, if you have a desire and you're not playing games with yourself, that when you die and when you're judged, because we all will be judged, that when the judge, who the Bible says is Jesus Christ, when he judges you, you will know that he was not just a mere man who walked this planet for 33 years. He was not just a human being who did mighty, miraculous things. Let me tell you, if you've never heard, who this little meek Jesus really is, was, and forever will be. This is what God's Word says. You can't prove God's Word is wrong. You can say, I don't believe that. I said that for 35 years. Ah, don't quote me something out of that Bible. Man wrote that Bible. You can't trust that Bible. That is made by man to brainwash the masses to control you. Guess what? When God got a hold of me, when I was going to destroy my life, and he became real to me when he didn't have to, he should not have. I did nothing to have him manifest his reality to me the way he did it in a moment of time. To this day, 22, 23 years later, I don't understand why he did it. All I know is I made a covenant with him. He made himself real to me. And after 23 years of walking in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there is absolutely no other way that I have seen that interests me. Not a billion dollars dangled in front of me could make me want to reject the one who showed up when I was about ready to pull the plug on my life. It was no one but the Spirit of Jesus Christ came into that room and made himself real to me and took a lifetime of agony and anger and frustration out of me in a moment of time when he didn't have to. And he did it. And I owe him, I owe the creator of the universe everything that I have. And I want to tell you about him if you've never heard who this Jesus is. In the book of John, New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. Let me repeat that. In the beginning was the Word, chapter 1 of the book of John, starting with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word <clears throat> was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, what did I just say? All things it says, were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Who's it talking about here? The Word. All things were made through the Word, and without the Word nothing was made that was made. In him was life. In who? In the word was life, and the life was the light of men. 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Get yourself a Bible, read the first chapter of John, see for yourself to make sure I'm not lying and conning you. Let's read on down to verse 14 about the Word. Chapter 1 of the book of John, verse 14, it continues, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Those are some big spiritual words for some of you who have not heard those words. Let's go on down. Verse 17. For through the law, or the Old Testament, which was you had to be good to be able to get to heaven was what they were taught. You had to not sin, otherwise God wouldn't accept you. That was what the law really entailed, and that's what was being spoken of here. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The connection here is that the Word is Jesus Christ, none other. The Bible says without apology, without trying to prove it, without trying to beat anybody over the head that in the beginning was Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ was with God and Jesus Christ was God. Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. Well, how can that be? Well, if you read in other portions of the Bible, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, because there are three persons in the eternal triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, or called Jesus Christ, or here called the Word, and then the Holy Spirit. Three separate persons, all functioning as one, having three different distinct personalities, though they're one. Okay? Jesus Christ is co-creator of all things. It says, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That means you, precious one. That means every human being who is following a different path to God is following a decoy, a counterfeit that Satan has handed humanity. And I don't care, I don't care what somebody else says about Jesus Christ. I choose to believe that the Bible now is true and no human being can prove that he is not exactly what the Bible says he is. No human being can prove that all things were not created through the Word, Jesus Christ. With that, we're going to shut the camera off a minute. We're going to pray and see what the Holy Spirit might have for us here. Uh, maybe Susan's going to come back and minister to us. Maybe some out of the Word. Maybe my wife will come and share. I don't really know. We're going to have to pray and see what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. But we can assure you that Jesus Christ is going to be heavily involved in whatever conversation we have to impart to you. Thank you. God bless you. <coughs> Hi, this is Susan again, and just um, coming to just really recap and, and add some scriptures that the Lord has really put in my spirit to share with you. And I just thank God for my husband, and he really didn't share at all. Powerful man of God, and truly when we met, you know, it was 1978, and some of you would say, well, how she have all those kids? <laughs> well, I had it one in 78, one in 79, one in 80 and two in 83 and how did that happen we won't even go into that but 
it happen. And, and so I love him. He's my husband. He's my lover. He's my right hand man. He's my best friend. He's everything that really God has joined us together. And we have made it legal. But just to share with you that even after um, the Lord delivered me from drugs, and I just really sensed in my spirit, you know, God really deals with me in things in that area. And just to be sensitive to that, how after he delivered me from drugs, I still struggled with promiscuity and fornication and, and ungodly relationships. And just really, even after waiting the seven and a half years, God, it was a process. God had to really strip those things out of me. He literally uh, uh, broke broke, I, I just really broke before the Lord and, and said, God, I don't want any of this. I want to wait for my husband and I want to wait the right way. And so what he had to do, he had to literally just strip me of all the things that I wanted to do. And I really sense that some of you, even in ungodly relationships, fornication and Shacking up, they may call it today, and know that God wants you to walk the right path. And, and the thing that he put in my spirit, Susan, you got to yield. I had to yield to the Holy Ghost, and yielding is a process. Yielding takes time, yielding and hearing the voice of the Lord. So I had to get out of myself, get out of what I wanted to do, and go the way God was saying, wait for him. I've chosen him for you. I have put him together, put him in your life for a reason, so you have to wait. And so I had to go through the process of being yielded and broken before the Lord. And that's where the Lord gave me in Romans. And I'm going to read a little bit of that to you. And it's out of Romans chapter 7. Verses 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which, we, which were aroused by the law, by the law, we're at the work in our members to bear fruit to death. So I was bearing fruits unto death. I was not bearing fruits unto righteousness because I was still in my sinful state. Even after he delivered me, I still carry those sinful things over into my salvation. And so God had to really wean me and show me, so you have to let those things go. And he, he began, this is the chapter that he began to deal with me and to break me and to break those things off of my life. He said, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what, we, what were, we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Meaning, I don't have to serve the enemy anymore. I don't have to be bound by fornication. I don't have to be bound by smoking. I don't have to be bound by things of my past. And it was really binding me up. And also, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I have not had known sin except through the law. For what I would not have known, covetousness, unless the law had said. And this is referring to the Old Testament scriptures and breaking down what the law really means. But we're not under law. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And I'm under the period of dispensation. We all are. But just saying that, I'm no longer bound by my past. I don't have to let the enemy keep throwing things up. You did this. And I was allowing the enemy to play with my mind and I struggled between letting this relationship go, letting this person go. And my husband knows every relationship I ever had. So it's not nothing what I'm saying to you. He knows this. Everybody that I've ever had in my life, everything that I've ever done, I shared it with him before he was even released. I, read, I, I, I uh, made a whole paragraph or different several paragraphs or I did a complete outline of my past and I shared it with him and I was open and not only was I open with him I had to be open with myself and no this is what I had to let go so some of you out there you have to be real with who you are and know that even though you don't see it you think that you can do what you can do before heaven gets the news but I guarantee you heaven already knows what you're doing Jesus Christ already knows it so you have to make a decision you have to make it your, make up your mind am I going to serve Christ or am I going to serve the world? And I'm just going to finish reading this. I would not have no covetous unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin taken opportunity by commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived me and I died. 
and the commandment which was to bring me life, I found to bring death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment, and sin was still wrecking havoc in my life. Even after I got saved, I, have to, I had to continue to pray to God. The, the, the sin of fornication gripped my soul so. Because I said I needed a man. My husband was not there for me and I needed a body. I kept saying that to me. I couldn't function. I couldn't live. How am I going to live by myself? But I had to realize I wasn't alone. Christ was with me all the time. And I had to grasp that. I had to understand that. And then I'm just going to go down to uh, where Paul says 13. The terrible inner conflict has then what is good became death to me certainly not but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful for we know that the law is spiritual but I am carnal sold under sin for what I am doing I do not understand for I will to do that I do not practice but what I hate that I do hated it I hated it, but yet I kept doing it. But Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this device? Who will? So I had to depend on Christ to deliver me. I had to reckon myself dead to everything around me. So Christ had to literally, and he literally ripped those things out of me. He severed though from the root. He just destroyed the works of the enemy that I thought that I had to live with forever. You don't have to be bound by fornication. In chapter 8 it says that, the first chapter in, in Romans verse 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit in life, Christ, for the law of the spirit, in the life of Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's no condemnation. I'm not under any condemnation. You don't have to be condemned. If you walk out on the enemy right now, condemnation walks out with him because there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Whatever you walk out on from the enemy, you walk out it free. And that's what I just speak, freedom and deliverance. Just be free in your spirit. Be free in your mind. Be free. Don't allow the enemy to set condemnation once the Lord has delivered you. And once he has set you free, you have to maintain your deliverance. You have to walk in it. You have to be made whole. Me and my husband, even today, deliverance is a daily thing. Paul said, I die daily. So we die daily. We're still struggling, but God is stripping off every pound, every pound of it. And we're being made whole in in the image of Christ. And, and, and I also really admire what Brother Norm and Sister Kathleen shared. I mean, God, those were powerful words. And they just uh, uh, encouraged me. I know, I know what the word says. Jesus Christ. He was with God in the beginning. The beginning was the word. Sister Kathleen shared some powerful things, how God just transformed her life, and now she's in the prison. So I know we can do things that God has taken us beyond what we can do. Never thought, I'm in school now, getting a bachelor's degree in substance abuse. God ordained month, a couple, oh, probably a month ago, minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are things I thought I would never, ever achieve. I was told that I was never going to be anything. I told that you're just crazy. You're just being tormented. God had given me the gift of prophecy. I would share it with people and they would tell me that I had been tormented. And these were gifts that God was pouring into me. I didn't know what they was, but once I got saved, you may not know what these things are. The gifts would just start going everywhere. I was like a, a, a bomb waiting to explode, but had no one to really share with me until I came here. Our pastors poured in, urged us. Train and terrain. This is what you do. This is who you are. You're a prophetess in the Lord. They confirm those things in me. So you're going to need people to confirm things in you. To pull out what's on the inside of you. So I'm not ashamed of who I am. I know what God has called me to be. And so these are the things that, that, that I'm learning. And they're teaching us. And so I'm on my way to destiny. So you have to be on your way to where God wants you to be. God knew who you were from the beginning of time. He created you from the beginning. And then he went back. He created all of this. And then he came back to the beginning of it. 
So he already knows what you are and who you're going to be. So you have to get in the Word. You have to know what God is calling you to do. Know who called it. God has called you to be. Know that and be encouraged. If you're in your sin, know that God sees you right where you are. He saw Zacchaeus right where he was. He saw him. Even when he was in the tree, he saw him. He saw Nathaniel sitting up under the tree, under the tree. He knew him before he even knew who he was. So God knows who you are. So know that. And just pray that God, that those that are just bound by addiction and habits, fornication, and I just really heard the Lord saying, fornication and even shacking, even if you're hearing the word and you know that God is pulling you out of these things, God, we pray that you break it and you sever it, even in the young people, the young couples, the young people that are going and struggling with fornication. The enemy of their soul. God, we're asking that you loose them in their minds. God, in the name of Jesus. And I plead the blood of the Lamb over your life right now. And I call you up out of darkness and up out of obscurity in the name of Jesus. And we speak deliverance. We speak salvation. God, that you would send someone to water. God, what you've already put in them. Send someone, God, that would minister salvation. Send someone that would mentor the young female, you're someone that would mentor the young male. Send someone, God. God, your main focus is souls. Winning the lost, he that winning souls is wise, God. Help us to be wise and over the souls that you've given us. And I pray, Father, I hedge of protection around those that you would set free, Father. Those that are being set free, we uh, uh, pray a hedge of protection around them, Father, that they would no longer want to go back to where they came from. And God, we're believing you for complete deliverance, for complete salvation for those that are struggling in their flesh, God, because we know that you are a deliverer. You're my deliverer. God, you delivered me when I thought that there was no hope. God, the day you showed up was the day I became free. And so, God, we thank you and we honor you. And I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that this word, Father, would be soil, that you would break up the stony hearts, break up the stony ground, Father, and all those that are listening, Father. And I just thank you and I just praise you, God, and I honor you. Let the word, let the word of God dwell richly in you. In the name of Jesus, read John. Read the book of John. Read it. Read it and let it saturate you. In the beginning was the word. We know that God sent his only son. Read that and let it take heart that he went away just to prepare a place for you. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I told the enemy. I told the devil. And I'm going to leave with this. I told him if there was no heaven, I wouldn't serve you. If there was no God, because he knows his end, all he has to do is flip over to Revelations, the last chapter, and it tells him that him and his angels will be thrown into the lake of fire. So he has no opportunity. He's not, he has no privileges to offer you. He has nothing to offer you but death. Death, and he knows that. He knows his end. He knows it. We're the only ones that don't because we don't believe hell is real. Hell is a real place. And it's a way. It was made and created for Satan and his angels. But it is open to you if you choose that way. We're praying that God, that you don't go that way. When God delivered me, I told the enemy I would never serve him again. Shooting vein, needles in my veins. I did heroin too. And I told the enemy, you should have had me then because it's over now. I'm going all the way for God. Just like I went all the way for him, I'm going all the way for the Lord. And I thank God. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm sold out for Christ. And I want everybody to know that I'm a sold out warrior. I wouldn't go back. My best days are yet ahead of me. They are. And I thank God. And I honor him. Hallelujah. And I praise him. And the song of my spirit, and I really can't sing, but it is, it's just, just piercing in my soul. And I'm just praying that, that the word Words. God, just help me. Just help me, Lord. Just help me, Lord. It's holiness. Holiness or hell. 
Holiness is what he longs for. Holiness is what we need, Father. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. The songs are so simple. It said, holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Thank you, Father. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. And then you have to ask him these, th these things to take your mind and to transform it. Take your heart and come form it. Ask him that. The song says, take my mind, transform it. Take my will, the stubborn will, and conform it to yours, O oh Lord. And I'm not a singer, but I guarantee you, if you ask the Lord to transform your mind, renew your spirit, and take your will, he gives us a will, and it's stubborn sometimes. But you ask him to take that stubborn will and submit it. Submit it. Take my heart and form it. That's it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, O oh Lord. God, we're asking that you take every mind, every heart, and every spirit, and God, and just conform it to the will of the Lord. And that's it. And I thank God for you. Amen. I hope my singing wasn't horrible. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. What an awesome privilege it has been today to do this video, this testimony with Susan and Perfecto. It has been such a, a blessing to me, and I hope it has been to you, too. If you haven't seen already on your screen, on the bottom of your screen, this tape number that we do, we do offer tape, tapes on free will offering basis. If you have a loved one that you would like to share this with or someone, someone that you know that is struggling right now and needs, needs God in their life, we encourage you to pick up the phone and give us a call and just request tape number 333. And when, when you get our ministry line, it will instruct you on what to, what to say. Just leave your name, address, and phone number, and the tape number, and also please say whether you want audio, cassette, or video. That way we will be sure to get the right tape to you. We just, I am so blessed and so excited to see how God is going to use this to minister to people out there, maybe yourself or someone you love that is so, so hurting and so, so void of God in their life right now. But there is hope. There is hope. Jesus is real and if you've heard anything today, you've heard the testimony of how real he is in both Susan's and Perfecto's life. He made himself so real and he was so faithful, so faithful to come to them, to their aid, when they were ready to really listen. That's the key. We need to be ready to listen. And I just want to encourage you, encourage you, don't, don't give up. Don't, don't let the enemy talk you out of what maybe you did. Maybe you prayed with Susan when she was praying. Don't, don't let the enemy talk you out of this because that's one thing that he likes to do with us when we are new Christians or when we're committing our, ourselves 
anew or afresh to God. He has so many ways to distract us and to keep us down and to keep us back. That's not what God wants. He wants us to be connected to the body of Christ and to Him, especially to Him. And with that, I want to I want to say one more thing too. In in the short time remaining here, don't let yourself be disconnected from the body of Christ. Get yourself in a local body, a church, a local church where you can be rooted and grounded in God's word, and you can grow in Him, and you can be used of Him too, because that's that's what it's all about. He wants to use each one of us to reach others for Him. So don't let the enemy talk you out of being in a local body of believers. If you're not in a church, I encourage you, get in one, find one, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. He will do that. And we just thank you and God bless you now. The woman that I was always looking for, I want to make that very clear because see, for a man to really establish himself, he must have a wife that he can truly trust. And she was the first woman that I ever trusted in my life. And so even that, I still, I still wind up in prison. You know, after we came united in 1980, I still wind up in prison. It hurt me and I thought my life was over. And I, I did what most people do when they go to prison. I, I wrote her a letter and told her to go on with her life. Forget about me because I messed up. And I say about a week later, I wrote her a letter again and told her, nope, I changed my mind. I can't do it. I got, you know, I'll be back. So in prison, me and my wife, we struggled. Well, she wasn't my wife then. But we struggled. I consider her my wife. I guess I'm proud to say that now. You know, she was always my wife, but you know, we made it legal after I got out of prison. But I always struggled with it. You know, I, my main thing until I decided that God wanted me to do this time 14 years, eight months. I couldn't see it. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. You know, but he, I had to do it. So I said, okay. If I do it, you got to show me that I'm going to have something worthy of me spending all this time in prison to change my life. And it, I say about, about the same time that I did this, Susan wrote me. As a matter of fact, ain't this something? She sent me a red sweatsuit in prison. Now I got red where I don't now. But she sent me a red sweatsuit that evening. I got it in the mail. And she was telling me that she wanted us to be together and and you know and you know and and move on with our lives. It was like an answer to that prayer that I had just spoke with God. I had asked him what was gonna happen, and he showed me that Susan was gonna be there for me when I got out. I still didn't believe it. I had to see more. And so as time went on. You know, as you heard my wife's testimony, she struggled with things, you know, that you know that we all go through, ups and downs. But one day I knew for sure she was a true Christian. And she convinced me of that, you know, and she kept trying to convince me that God was the way. And I kept listening to her and I didn't, I never really wanted to deny her. But I wasn't one too very easy to convince. You know, I believed, you know, we could make a life, but you know, I didn't I didn't know if God was really for me. But at the end of my time in prison, there was my wife waiting there. She came and picked me up, you know, sometimes guys, you know, in prison, you know, waiting for something to pick you up and they never show up. I was prepared to catch the bus. But she was there, and she brought me home. And I say within two weeks, we was married. 
And I, you know, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm still a hard man to convince. You know, even though I committed all these crimes and, and, and did all these wrong things in my life, I know the most important thing in my life was having a woman to love me and I could trust. And that's what brought me to God, Jesus Christ. But even when, even coming to Jesus Christ with, with this most important woman, which I knew, I used to watch her. You know, I go to church with her. You know, I was kind of laid back. And even, uh, even my pastor always told me, you know, that I didn't really accept God completely. And I, and I felt that was true because, you know, I'm always, I have to see more than what, what people say. I believe in doing, and I believe people have to do more for me to be convinced. But I'm convinced now that Jesus is the way, you know. I did, I mean, I did some, looking at me right now, you couldn't even believe, or, you know, that I was really, you know, I robbed banks, you know, and I, and I you know, I had, Great fun in it. I didn't really like causing people harm. I guess that's probably why I really started robbing banks. I felt I could just take the money out the banks and not harm people. But sometimes people can't get hurt in them things. But that's, that's my past. And I know some people thrive on, you know, the wrong things in life. But I know robbing banks you know, or, or, you know, taking other people's money, anything. I know that's not right. And we all know that's not right. I, I, don't, want, I don't want guys in prison to think just because you want to be a Christian, you're soft, or you, you're not a man. I discovered it takes a greater man to be a Christian than me not a Christian. I discovered that and that and that and that and that, that makes me real proud because now I can say, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, and I don't I don't feel shame and I don't feel slighted. And I'm telling you, what I what I've discovered most of all is it's kinda of difficult for me to talk on television, you know, because it's you know, it's, I don't know what we do when we get on T V we just forget so much, but I could never forget that if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people say, now how can a man say Jesus Christ? But I tell you, what made me discover Jesus was the one that guided us through all these troubles. I've thought about all these different people who claim to have 